Sue heard Johnsy cough. It was a wet, deep cough. Johnsy stared off into the distance for a moment, then shook her head before returning to her canvas. She had felt the crackling in her chest that time and knew it was coming. For some reason, it felt like if she just didn't acknowledge it, didn't make it real by calling it what it was, pneumonia, then maybe it would pass her by. Maybe it would really be nothing. She had come all the way from California to New York City. There, she met Sue in a diner on 8th. As it turned out, they were both painters, and Sue was looking for a roommate. They got along instantly. They liked the same music, food, and art. Sue showed Johnsy the place. It was wide and well-lit and dingy, and it was theirs. Johnsy moved in shortly thereafter, and she was happy. That was spring. She had no idea how cold winters in Greenwich Village could really be. Johnsy had never even seen snow, and the apartment that was warm in summer and a little drafty in fall fell frigid in the winter. She bought a coat, but it was too late. One by one, their friends started to come down with it. Pneumonia moved through the village like an old man with icy fingers, touching everyone he could. Sue had lived in New York her whole life, but she had never seen this many sick people. She and Johnsy had barricaded themselves in their apartment. In fact, Sue refused to let Johnsy even go out for groceries. She was right to be worried. And when the cough echoed through the room that day when they were painting, Sue knew that her friend was in trouble. It was two days later when, shivering with a fever of 103, Johnsy didn't feel like getting out of bed. Her cough ricocheted through the apartment, filling Sue with dread every time. She sat loyally by her friend, day in and day out, as she descended into fever-induced madness. Then, the counting began. I'm Jason Weiser. From Bardic, this is Fictional. Sue heard the coughing through the door as she talked to the doctor. The man was busy. He didn't have time to save people who didn't even want to live. Sue spat back that Johnsy didn't want to die. What was wrong with the doctor, anyway? The guy shook his head. It wasn't like that at all. It wasn't that she wanted to die. She was terrified of it. Johnsy had just decided that she wasn't going to get well. She decided that she was going to die from this. And when a sick person felt the way she did, half of his work proved useless. Was there anything troubling her? Sue shook her head. Not that she knew of, anyway. Johnsy had always wanted to go to Italy and paint a picture by the Bay of Naples. The doctor shook his head. Not like that. Was there a man in her life or something? Sue looked incredulously at him. A man? Is a man worth... No. No, doctor. There's not a man. The doctor shrugged. Well, like he said, he'd do all he could. Johnsy had a chance. A very small chance. If she became hopeful about the future, her chances might greatly improve. He recommended that Sue try to get her talking about shoes or clothes or whatever they ladies like to talk about to get her excited about the days ahead. Painting. We're painters, Sue said, not batting an eye. Yeah, sure, painting, whatever, the doctor replied, arm already halfway in his coat and mind halfway down the hallway. He had to go. He was late for his next appointment. The coughing had faded by the time Sue quietly closed the door to the apartment behind her. She went to the workroom to balled up rags and cried into them so she wouldn't wake Johnsy from her hard-won sleep. The counting began hours later. Sue had recomposed herself, gathered up her paints and a canvas, and went to sit by Johnsy in bed. She could hear Johnsy cough, and so she figured she would enter the room with a smile and a song. Johnsy wasn't strong enough to sit up and paint, but maybe Sue's company would be enough. Fifteen. Johnsy said in little more than a hoarse whisper. Sue heard her mumbling in her sickness. She didn't think anything more of it until Johnsy opened her eyes and said twelve. Before Sue could ask, Johnsy looked like she was going to cry as she mumbled eleven, and then ten, nine, eight, and then seven. Sue followed her friend's gaze, stood, and looked out the window. There was nothing outside, only the other building and a gnarled old tree that grew up the side of it. Winter had already touched the tree, 
and almost all the leaves were gone. What's going on? Sue asked. Six, Johnsy stated. She turned to Sue. The leaves were falling faster now. Three days ago, there were almost a hundred. It hurt her eyes to keep them open long enough to count, but she did. Now, well, now it's easy to count. She gasped. There goes another one. There were only five now. Sue didn't understand. Leaves, Johnsy said. Leaves on the tree. When the last leaf falls, I must go too. I've known now for three days. The doctor, didn't he tell you? Sue looked down at her Johnsy. No, no, that was ridiculous. She tried to tell Johnsy that the doctor said that she would be fine. Her chances were good. She should try to eat. Maybe Sue could buy something good for her. Something that would make her strong. A melancholic smile came to rest on Johnsy's face. No, Sue shouldn't buy anything for her. Oh, there goes another. No, she didn't want anything to eat. She wanted to see the last leaf fall before the night. Then, she would go too. Sue stared at the floor. This was exactly what the doctor had warned her about. Johnsy needed a reason to live. And this stupid leaf delusion, it would kill her. She was in the grips of a fever. Clearly, she didn't know how ridiculous she was being. Sue urged Johnsy to keep her eyes closed, please. Sue needed to work on this painting so that they could eat. And she needed the light from the window so she couldn't shut it. Would Johnsy just please not look at the leaves? For Sue, Johnsy agreed. She closed her eyes and lay back against the pillows. She told Sue to tell her the moment the painting was finished. She didn't want to miss the last leaf falling to the ground. She wanted to say goodbye. Sue stifled a tear, waited for Johnsy to fall asleep, and left. Two floors down, Sue knocked on Mike Behrman's door. When he didn't answer, she let herself in. He was there, sitting in the dark. From the radiating smell of whiskey, she knew what he had been doing. Behrman had been painting for 40 years now. Correction, Behrman had been painting terribly for 40 years. He made a little money by letting people paint him, and subsequently drank most of that money, but it was enough to afford him a dingy basement apartment. He made absolutely nothing from his paintings, but he talked incessantly about his masterpiece, the one painting he was yet to paint. The one that, after he painted it, his life's work would be complete. He wouldn't be a failure anymore. Of course, he hadn't even started it yet. The thing was, he had a look about him, a dignified look that made other painters want to put him on their canvas. That's why Sue was there today. She wanted Behrman to sit for her painting that she was trying to sell. Paintings with Behrman, for some reason, always sold better. Behrman pursed his lips and took another swig from his flask. Oh, that's why she had told him this sob story about John Z and the leaves. She wanted him to sit for free. Nope, he would not sit for her painting, but he would come see John Z in person. She was a sweet kid. This world was no place for someone like John Z to lie sick. When they returned, John Z was still sleeping, so the pair covered the window. They went to the workroom, the one with the wide window where they could see the tree. They watched three more leaves fall before it grew dark. Behrman sat with Sue, while the woman worked through most of the night. When sleep finally took her, an hour before dawn, he covered her with a blanket and went home. Sue woke to coughing, brushed her hair to the side, and went to Johnsy. Johnsy didn't say hello. She didn't ask how Sue was doing. She only asked to see the leaves. Leaf, Sue corrected, as she pulled the cover away from the window. She had glanced before entering the room. She knew the tree was down to one final leaf. It was still dark green near the branch, but the edges were turning yellow with age. Johnsy nodded. She was sure it would fall during the night. But now she saw. It was hanging on for her. It was hanging on so she could see it fall today. So she could know it was time. When it did, she would fall too. Sue begged her not to be ridiculous. It was a leaf. Think about me, she tried. Johnsy, if you die, what will I do? But Johnsy didn't reply. She closed her eyes 
and tears ran silently down her cheeks. Bamram returned later that day to say hi to Johnsy, but she was sleeping again. He looked at the leaf and shook his head. One left. It would fall, and Johnsy would give up. Sue covered the window when it started to rain. She knew it would happen and hoped to keep Johnsy from seeing the bare branches for as long as she could. The storm beat against the side of the building. Sue was up all night next to Johnsy, holding her hand. Though she knew the leaf thing was ridiculous, she couldn't help being superstitious. If Johnsy died that night, Sue wanted to be there with her. Sue woke with a start the next morning, the sunlight hemming the edges of the curtains. Johnsy was shaking her, asking her to open the window. She needed to see if it was time. Sue took a deep breath and opened the curtains. She exhaled. There, on the tree that snaked up the other building, was the last leaf still hanging on. Sue was relieved but surprised. Johnsy smiled and turned to her friend. Something has made that last leaf stand there to show me how bad I was. Johnsy declared. It was wrong to want to die. I'll try to eat now. But first, bring me a looking glass so that I can see myself. And then I'll sit up and I'll watch you cook. An hour later, she began talking again. Sue, someday I hope to paint the Bay of Naples. The edges of Sue's mouth curled into a smile. Johnsy was starting to act like Johnsy again. The doctor returned that afternoon. And Sue, once again, followed him out into the hall. It was better news this time. The doctor said he didn't know what Sue did, but Johnsy was probably going to be okay. She needed rest and plenty of liquids, but she was going to get through this. The doctor apologized for being so rude last time. It was difficult. He'd had to bury some of his patients. For instance, the old man, that drunk in the basement. He had been found just this morning. Probably has pneumonia too. If Johnsy could barely beat it, a man in his 60s after decades of rough living? Uh, the doctor sighed. He tipped his hat and said goodbye to Sue. Behrman died two days after Johnsy got better. He had been found the morning Johnsy improved. His door was wide open, and he had just collapsed inside. His clothes were soaking wet. He had almost no money and even fewer friends, so Sue agreed to help clean his apartment after he passed. When she entered, days later, the coat they had found him in was still damp and cold. Sue furrowed her brow. She could see the spot where he had collapsed that morning. Everything he had been carrying had flown out from that spot. The people in the building didn't think much of it, but Sue looked at the colors of the paint. It was green and yellow. She looked at the rain-smeared palette. Finally, she dug her hands into the wet pockets of the coat he had been wearing and pulled out one solitary leaf was still green at the very tip of the stem where it had clung to the branch, its edges turning yellow with age. Sue gasped. No one had known why Bearman went out on such a cold, rainy night with a pneumonia outbreak going around, but Sue did. She dropped everything and ran to Johnsy's room. She pulled open the curtains and saw it there, still hanging on the tree, looking the exact... There's another story this week by the same author who we'll talk about at the end of the show. But that will be right after this. This week's episode is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience, one night at a time. We have a Casper, well, we actually have two. When it came time for our son to move into a big kid bed, we went to Casper.com that day and bought the mattress. He loves his, we love ours. It's the single best mattress I've ever used. They have three different models, the original, the Wave, and the Essential. They're perfectly designed to smooth and cradle your natural geometry, and the breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And it's something you really have to experience. And you can. For 100 nights risk-free, it's delivered to your door in a surprisingly small box. Like, a suspiciously small box that actually contains a mattress. It's crazy. And they do it with free shipping and returns to the US and Canada. You spend a third of your life sleeping. It's probably more than you do any other single activity, if you think about it. You should really be comfortable. You can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash fictional and using fictional at checkout. That's casper.com slash fictional offer code fictional for $50 off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions apply. All right, 
Now on to the second story today. Soby rubbed his hands together. It was late October, and warmth had stuck around longer than it deserved. It was time to make other plans. Three newspapers in the alley last night, and he still couldn't get warm. Now, he sat on his bench in Madison Square, his feet rustling in the fallen leaves. People were starting to wear their winter coats. Soapy had a winter coat, probably a better one than all of them. But you could only stay so warm in a coat on these freezing New York City nights in the dead of winter. He recalled the summer days. Those were nice. You could sleep in the park, and the people were happy. Winter, though. During the winter, other New Yorkers made plans to go to Florida or some sunny shore in the Mediterranean Sea. So be it some place he was planning to go, too. Some place warm, with a bed and meals. So be was going to go to prison. It was his winter home, of sorts. He would be safe from the cold north winds, safe from the winter diseases, and safe from the cops. It was a nice little vacation that kept him alive until spring. Now, he just needed to do something that would only land him there for three months. He didn't want to miss the whole year. Three months would be just long enough to get him through the worst of the winter, and then get him back on the streets when things started to improve. Of course, there were places in the city you could go for food and a bed during the winter, but Soapy had his pride. They wouldn't make him pay, of course, but they would make him wash and answer questions and get all into his life. No, prison was better. Prison had rules, of course, but in a prison... His life would still be his life. He found the best route to prison last year, and he was all too happy to repeat his offense this year. Go and have a meal, a great meal, the best meal he could buy, or rather, the best meal he couldn't buy. All he had to do was sit there and say he couldn't pay. The cops would be called, and they would arrest him. He'd go before a judge, and the judge would do the rest. No problem. It would all be quiet, quick, and delicious. Soapy saw the head waiter's disapproving look before he felt the very strong and unyielding hands of the waitstaff slash bouncer grab him by the collar and toss him hard onto the sidewalk. Ouch. All right. The delicious way was not going to work. Not this year, anyway. Soapy needed new shoes and pants to get him into any place that would bother to call the cops for him not paying. Two years ago, he made the mistake of going too cheap and ended up just getting a boot to the face in an alley. No, it was clear he needed to try something different. Down on 6th, he passed a window. A big, glowing monstrosity with a ton of electric lights. He paused and began to walk by when his shabby shoe landed on a rock. Hmm. The shattering window brought bystanders running from all directions. A cop was the first one there, and Soapy stood smiling. This was it. This was his ticket to the island. He might get four to six months for this, depending on what he damaged inside, but the cold was starting to bite at him. He needed to go to the prison on Blackwell's Island. Who did this? The cop barked at the bystanders. They all shook their heads while Soapy stood there grinning ear to ear. But the cop didn't notice his smile or him clearing his throat. Finally, Soapy flat out asked the cop if uh, he thought it could be old Soapy here. The cop looked him up and down. Uh, no. Being a police officer, he knew a thing or two about police work and suspects usually didn't just stand around and ask police if they did a crime. They usually ran. Like that guy. The cop caught sight of someone running down the street and took off after him. Soapy tried to yell that, no, seriously, actually did it, please arrest him. But the cop couldn't hear him. After the window fiasco, Soapy grudgingly tried the restaurant plan again. This time, at a cheaper restaurant, the one that wouldn't object to his shoes and pants. However, his fears and prior experience were confirmed as... After he flat out asked them to call the cops because he couldn't pay, they tossed him even harder onto the sidewalk and gave him a little extra for his trouble, threatening worse if he ever came back. Of course, they also refused to get the police involved. It was the first really, really cold night, and Soapy was starting to worry. He was having bum luck, and he was so down that he couldn't even chuckle to himself at that deft use of the phrase bum luck. How was it so... So difficult to go to prison in the city. He had managed for years on end, but now he had struck out three times. He continued to wear down his shoes walking downtown about another half mile when he saw a beautiful young woman standing mere feet from a police officer. Soapy grimaced. 
He didn't like it, but he had an idea. He took off his hat and smoothed out his hair as he sauntered on over to the woman, who was about a decade younger than him. The cop was already eyeing him as he approached. He took a few steps toward the woman, and she shuffled a few steps away. Finally, Soapy sidled up right next to her and grinned. Now to really uncomfortably lay it on. Good evening, Bedelia. Don't you want to come and play with me? He said in the creepiest voice he could muster. Soapy watched the woman stand there awkwardly, seemingly unsure of how to deal with this guy that was all but pressed up against her on a crowded city street. As he saw the cop looking at him and the girl in obvious discomfort, he could already feel the relatively soft prison cot and the warmth of the prison blankets. But she didn't move. She didn't pull away. She didn't get the cop. She just stood there. The cop looked at the two apparently consenting adults, shrugged, and walked away. He had better things to do. Some nut was smashing windows and harassing waiters uptown. When the cop was gone, the young woman slid her hand around Soapy's arm and pulled him close. Soapy looked at her in shock. She was into it? She whispered that she would be down for anything if you bought her a drink. She would have said something sooner, but, you know, the cop was watching. Soapy's eyes widened. Oh, okay, no. He definitely couldn't afford a drink or any of that. And if he didn't pay those people, they wouldn't just throw him down onto a sidewalk. He smiled sheepishly and told her to lead the way. When they turned the corner, he wrenched his arm away from hers and ran as fast as he could. Sexual harassment, two restaurants, and blatant vandalism hadn't worked. This had to. Soapy thought to himself as, feigning drunkenness, he danced in the street and berated a cop to his face. He started to draw a crowd, and the cop turned to a bystander, telling the man that this guy was just one of those college kids. There had been a game that night. They were just excited from the win. They had specific orders not to arrest people who were simply drunk, but not really causing trouble. When he heard this, Soapy gave up the ruse and stormed off in a huff. He might as well save his voice. His ears burned as the wind blew harder, and he pulled his coat tighter around his body. He needed to get inside. Tonight. Then, he saw a man in a shop buying a newspaper. He was standing there paying, with his umbrella by his side. Soapy gritted his teeth and walked into the store. He tapped the man on the shoulder so he would see, and snatched the umbrella before walking away. My, my umbrella, the man stammered. Oh, oh, is it your umbrella? Soapy shot back. Then why don't you call a cop? I took it. Go ahead and call one. There's one right there on the corner. I'll wait. Soapy looked on the victim with glee, but the outrage didn't manifest. Instead, the man's shoulders slumped. I, I'm sorry. You know how these things happen, the man said. I just found it this morning at a restaurant. If it's yours, I hope you'll forgive me. The man watched Soapy clench his fists and grit his teeth raging at him about the umbrella. He shook his head. He deserved that. He shouldn't have taken an umbrella that didn't belong to him. Soapy stormed off, and it was only three blocks later that he calmed down enough to realize that he was still holding the umbrella, so he threw it into the river. The wind raged, but he started to accept it. He seemed to be cursed. Whatever. Soapy decided to go home, even if home was just a bench in Madison Square. He turned a corner, and then stopped. It was late. It was quiet. So quiet, that he could hear the song coming from the old, old church to his right. He could hear the birds. The moon above was peaceful and bright. He heard the song. It was a song he had known well, long, long ago. In those days... His life contained warmth and flowers and a mother and hopes and friends and clean thoughts and clean clothes. It had been so long since he had thought of home, since he had thought of who he had once been. And who was he now? He had spent all night trying to go to prison to get warm. Where did things go this wrong? How had he fallen this far? How had this become normal? He was almost sick with despair at the memory of what his life had been. Taking a deep breath, he decided that no. He was alive. 
He was healthy. He was strong. He was young, too. Well, young enough. He could still change. A man had offered him a job not too long ago. It was summer. And life was easy then. He liked his life. He liked living in filth and grifting strangers. So he had laughed at the guy. Tomorrow. Tomorrow he would find that man. And he would throw himself at his feet. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. He would find a purpose and follow it. He didn't want to go to prison anymore. He wanted to be somebody in the world. He would... He felt a hand on his arm. He spun around to look in the face of a cop. What are you doing hanging around here? Asked the cop. Nothing, replied Soapy. You think I believe that? Said the cop. Soapy laughed. He didn't care what the cop believed. He wasn't up to anything. He was standing here listening to the music in the church. He had rights. Who was this cop to get in his face and give him problems? Soapy was full of new strength. He was proud to be standing up for himself. Oh, standing here listening to music, huh? The cop said. That sounds a lot like loitering. Come with me. Soapy pulled his arm away and said that he would not. He was adamant that his new life awaited him, and he didn't have time for this. In the end, Soapy did go with the police officer, though it's not like he had much of a choice. And when he went before a judge in the morning, he did so both for loitering and resisting arrest, a charge that earned him a three-month prison sentence on Blackwell's Island. The stories today were by the U.S. author William Porter, who wrote them under the pen name O. Henry. You probably heard of The Gift of the Magi. That's him. He's a well-known short story writer whose works feature twist endings. I really liked how the stories today humanize people who might otherwise be marginalized by society. A pair of working women in 1900, the failed alcoholic painter who died to save a young woman, and a homeless man rediscovering his purpose in life. Anyway, they were titled The Last Leaf and The Cop and the Anthem. And now it's time for the worst of the best. This is a shorter segment where I tell the stories of ridiculous comic book heroes and villains. The hero this time is a man by the name of Richard Stanton, millionaire retired actor and vigilante. Okay, so the year is 1940. Comic book publishers are still trying to crack the code in terms of getting the masked vigilante down. Batman debuted the previous year, Spider-Man and Daredevil still had a couple of decades, but one publisher called Crack Comics really might have thought they had a hit on their hands. The hero is a man both extremely successful and broken. He was a world-renowned actor who retired at the top of his career to unanimous praise. What does he do with his millions? Invests them in the early 1920s when investing was a really good idea, and then he gets out before the late 1920s where investing was a really bad idea. Not only is he beloved the world over, but he's a multimillionaire in a time when, yeah, that was basically as rich as you got. Unfortunately, that type of success attracts good attention and it attracts bad attention. Richard Stanton was more than happy to live out his life as a philanthropist. But that was when tragedy struck. His young daughter was kidnapped. He paid the ransom, but the girl never returned home. Richard Stanton was crushed, but his wife was broken. She died shortly after she realized that her daughter wasn't coming home. Richard just had one name to go off of on his quest for justice, John Carver. He was the man who took everything from Richard. Unfortunately, Carver had left town. Richard knew what he must do. He must leave and he must train. He must cease to be Richard Stanton, millionaire actor and professional handsome guy. He must track Carver down and bring him to justice. Unfortunately, he was Richard Stanton, beloved the world over as a millionaire actor and professional handsome guy. Everyone knew his name. He knew if he went out at night and hunted criminals, he would need another name. He would need a disguise so different, so unlikely that he would move invisibly in the criminal underworld. Of course, he chose to disguise himself as a female senior citizen and go by the name Madame Fatal. No, not Madame Fatale, to play off of the femme fatale or something. No, Madame Fatal, the geriatric crime fighter. He was apparently good enough at hair, makeup, and voices from his acting days to pull off the disguise and live for nine years while he slowly moved closer to Carver. The criminals thought that the 6'1 burly grandma was a feeble elderly woman, as she pretended to be. That is, until she was feeding criminals their teeth in a back alley. Stanton would use the disguise to gain access to things. Case in point, he finally got Carver's address by asking the mailman to root through the mail for a stamp from Madame Fatal's grandson's stamp collection. When the time came, Madame Fatal threw herself in front of Carver's man's car and 
Feeling bad for the elderly woman who had to weigh close to 200 pounds, they carried her inside. Stanton revealed himself and Carver pulled a gun on him, prompting Stanton to drop to the ground and pull the rug out from under him, causing him to shoot himself in the chest. As Carver died, he dropped a bombshell. He confirmed that Stanton's daughter was alive, but his life left him before he could tell the man where. Seeing as nine years as an elderly woman had worked on his quest for vengeance, he decided to stay as Madame Fatal, fight for justice, and search for his daughter. He was a true professional, and he would never break character either. I can imagine the people he saved standing around talking to him, saying, I mean, we just saw you beat up several imposing henchmen, Madame Fatal, we don't know who you are, you really don't have to pretend like you have to get back because you have a casserole in the oven for your grandchild's visit. Really, we don't care. Just thank you for saving our lives from a Nazi submarine. And yeah, like a lot of the US comic book characters in the 1940s, Madame Fatal helped fight World War II on the home front. And I have to say, like Dog Welder from a couple episodes back, that was mainly a funny, joking superhero that they wrote with that in mind. Madame Fatal, completely serious. DC Comics acquired the rights to Madame Fatal in 1956, so if you want a Madame Fatal movie, they're the people to write to. That's it for this week. Today's episode was written by me, Jason Weiser, and edited by Carissa Weiser. Our theme song is by the amazing Breakmaster Cylinder. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.